I'll type the word. Okay, well, this is uh, programming. Uh, what is it called? Deep learning for coders, part two B or something. I don't know. <laughs> part two, lesson 15, which has the title autoencoders. And we actually do talk about autoencoders somewhere in there. So let me see if I can remember how to share my screen now. I use too many different programs. Uh, this one, yeah, there we go. You should be able to see my notebook now. Move that out of the way. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Move this out of the way too. Okay. Uh, so this, like I said, lesson 15 about autoencoders. So the goal he states at the beginning here is to create a convolutional autoencoder, which if you remember, has the goal of compressing and decompressing images. Uh, or I, that's what he, the way he states, but the idea is to try to create some kind of smaller representation of the image. I guess that's what compressed means, but <laughs> a smaller representation with some meaning, hopefully, to it that we can use eventually for uh, stable diffusion, right? To, for generation of images. So the first step here, though, is to look at the convolutional part of it. Uh, we need to make some convolutional layers. And for this, we start with notebook seven. So we're going to go through, I think, three notebooks in here or two and, a, and start the third one. Uh, just be aware. So the first one is, or he goes through uh, three notebooks. The first one is a convolutions note, notebook. Um, the video, by the way, for this one, you guys all noted, I'm sure, as well, is an hour and 37 minutes long. So I only have an hour or not even that. So I'm not going to repeat everything he did, which was not really the goal anyway. But it's just uh, just to kind of go over uh, go over to highlight things that I thought were interesting or uh, to comment on. So first thing we do is we import everything all over again. So we're going to get set up again. And what he's been doing as he goes along is creating this min AI library. And hopefully you've been doing that as well as you go on. As you can see, I misspelled it. He actually it's mini AI, but I didn't have my glasses on that day or whatever, and I called my min AI. So. <laughs> It's like, it's kind of works out well because now it's in my advantage. Every time I copy his code over, I know, oh, I better check mine because that reminds me that I have a different library than him. So I've been creating this library along uh, the way. And, and to do that, all you need to do is create a little folder inside your uh, folder, call it mini AI or mini AI or call it whatever you want. Um, you need to have one of these init.py is in there, underscore, underscore, dunder, right? Underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. But it doesn't need to have anything in it. It could have things in it. There's things you can put in here that every time the module is loaded, it will do for you. And if you look in some uh, published libraries, you'll see there's stuff that happens in here. Usually, all that happens is importing or in re importing things from sub modules so that they're more readily available. But you only need a blank one to make a module. And once you've done that, to make it so you can just do this kind of importing, you have to pip install it locally. And and so this, he talks a little bit about this. But all you do is uh, call pip install dash e, which means editable and dot, which install you know, in the root directory, not inside that. Uh, I don't know if you can see them down here, but in the see, I'm, I'm here in my uh, uh, root directory of the project. So this is where I would do that pip install um, dash e dot dot means here. Uh, dot e, dash e means editable. That means when you make changes, you don't have to reinstall it automatically. You can do that with other modules too. Um, if you if you get the source code for them, uh, if you want to install like the Mesa agent, which I'm using, the Mesa agent, a Mesa agent based library, you can install it locally. And that way, when I have to make changes to the Mesa code, because I've been trying to help them with it, um, you can just easily see what happens. Okay, that's a little aside there, went a little bit further than you yeah. said that I intended. But um, for me, I actually just I created an environment YML for Conda, where it, if I need to rebuild this environment, I'll just install all these things, including the pip stuff, including the dash e dot. You can actually put that in your environment.yml. Just an aside, I don't think he covered that, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's a thing. So once we've done that, um, he installs a lot more stuff that he's installed before. These are the same things he's been installing all along. Uh, this, and then we have to load the images back in, the uh, fashion imness stuff from last time. So this is just kind of getting us back where we were when we left off last time. We, this is not the fashion. This is the uh, regular MNIST data, right? I believe, yeah. Looks like it, right? Yeah. We're, we're looking at numbers. We're going to get to the fashion MNIST stuff right now, right? Uh -huh. Numbers. Uh, so just a reminder, 
uh, the convolutions are kind of a filter that you apply to an image to detect patterns in the image, right? And we and I also remind you, this is lesson eight. We've already covered this in detail. If you're going through this video, going, this seems familiar, this spreadsheet, right? The reason it why- It because, felt like it was repetitive with, yeah, because I think I presented that one. I'm like, hey, you this, did, Aaron. So I'm like, all right, this, this has all been done before. So, uh, so I'm not gonna go over, I'm not gonna go through the spreadsheet again. I'm not gonna go through any of that stuff again, because we already did it. And he did it again in the video, so. Um, the Excel sheet and, yeah. yeah and the Excel spreadsheet is messaging me. Um, that was my Cox company telling me they're still working on my service back on. So it's on now. So I hope that doesn't mean they're gonna fix something and break it. So hopefully not, just be aware of that. I'll, I'll get on my phone and message you in Slack or something happens. Any event, uh, sorry. So we covered this in chapter eight, but I do want to, he did mention this idea of, this, of a, I don't think he called it inductive bias, but there's this idea of inductive bias that when we use these convolution filters, these convolutional layers, they're a restricted, they're, there's nothing that they can't learn that a completely normal linear layer couldn't learn with a lot more parameters, it's just to be very difficult to train. In fact, probably, you know, not even tractable, right? But by inducing, so by producing some uh, structure, by in the thing by saying, oh, only the all these different uh, um, parameters are all the same, essentially, right? We're saying all these parameters are the same, we're reusing them because we're using the same kernel over all these different parts of the image. That's like saying all these different parameters in this big giant matrix are all the same. And that's the inductive bias. So it's kind of an interesting way of encoding into the model some features that we expect in the data. That's why it's kind of a, a bias, a bias in a good way rather than a bad way. I, I was, Tell one of my sponsors this the other day about some other things. Like, well, we don't want anything to be biased. They go, oh, okay, maybe it's a big bad word to use in this context. <laughs> it's not that kind of bias. Not all bias is bad. So anyway, here's this ex example model. Um, again, convolutions are, are made by proceeding up, uh, sliding a kernel over the image, multiplying. It's multiplying the values in the kernel by the values in the image, right? Ele element wise, a dot product, and then we sum the results. So just remember that. Element-wise multiplication, sum the results. That should ring bells, <laughs> right? Because we've seen this before. And so we can use, but we can create different kernels to detect different things. For example, here's a kernel that will detect the top edge. Here's a left edge. Here's a right edge. And here, or sorry, these are a diagonal, uh, two different types of diagonals, right? And I'm not going to go into detail because we've done that before, but just to, to have them defined because we're going to need them here. Um, I'm going to stack them all up in one big... Uh, tensor, because I'm going to want to do all these at one time for speed purposes, right? So now we've got basically the thing with this is a this is a three by three kernel, but now we're taking a one one uh, channel input image, a black and white image, and we're going to use four different kernels to create a four channel image now, a different channel for each one of the different kernels. So let's get back to images. Um, he goes through in the video at this point a Python pure Python implementation, which again involves three four loops, I guess. Probably right because it's which multiplication it turns out. So I'm going to skip over that because he did it and it's fine. And we've done it before in the in the previous lesson eight. Uh, but again, like I said, this is element wise multiplication followed by sum. We should be able to somehow express that as matrix multiplication, right? Because that's what matrix multiplication is. And this is what he talks about next. And there is um, I forget what he calls it now. Shoot. Um, what is it called? Was there uh, matrix like, mat to mat to call or lin to call or to like in, in to call or something like that? Yeah, there's some name for it. Yeah, but anyway, and, and, it, and there's a function in PyTorch, right, that does that. Right, that's what I was going to talk about right here. So this is there's okay. a function called unfold, which does this. Basically, you just take the image, which is a two by two, uh, rank two tensor, and then um, unfold it into a new matrix so that each column is all the elements that you multiply by the flattened kernel. So unfolding is kind of a weird word, but it takes the, the image and reorganizes the elements and copies them over and over again uh, so that it has the right shape. So you can then multiply it by a, a kernel that's been flattened out. So it turn, in other words, it turned into a matrix multiplication. And just to kind of see how that works, um, I'm just going to create a little four by four matrix here. And what we're going to imagine doing is uh, running a two by two kernel over this. So I should, I want to run a kernel that multiplies element wise zero, these elements, one, zero, one, four, and five. And then one, I'll do stride one, right? One, two, five, and six, two, three, six, and seven. Those are the sub, those are the little pieces I want to multiply my two by two kernel over, which will flatten out to a one by four kernel, right? When I when I flatten it. 
So what I want is a matrix whose columns are essentially is these elements, 0, 1, 4, 5, you know, 1, 2, 5, 6. And that's what unfold exactly does. Um, it creates a, now a, um, well, let's just show it. This is what it creates out of that matrix when I unfold it. Um, so now you can see each column is exactly those elements that need to be now be element-wise multiplied by my 1 by 4 kernel when it's flattened out. So I take the 2 by 2 kernel, whatever it is, and I'm going to flatten out to a 1 by 4 kernel. And now, now, now you can see I just have a matrix multiplication. I have to transpose it because I matrix multiplication, you multiply columns by, by, but this is the way it comes out unfolded. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, so each one of these columns is, is a different 4 by 4 section in that matrix. So it's it's uh, redundant. It copies stuff. It's not it's not very. Uh, hopefully, in the actual implementation, it doesn't actually copy the. Maybe it does. I don't know. Maybe it's better if it does. But you can see like two appears two times and five. Everything appears two times in this thing because they appear in two different kernels. But even even with that extra like memory constraint, it's going to be faster, right? Because you're that's now, most yeah. So here we're I'm doing all the compute on the yeah. on the GPU on the GPU, yeah. Or even without the GPU, just being able to do it on the CPU using a matrix multiplication rather than having to do the for loops ourselves is a big still going to be more efficient. Right. So again, I'll take another image from that batch that's uh, oops, zero. And then we can see, okay, here I unfold it, uh, the image. I'm not going to show what it looks like, but now I'm using a three by three kernel. I, I did two by two because it's easier to see um, up there. But now we do a three by three kernel. It's going to do the same kind of thing. I'm not going to show it, but I just multiply it, matrix multiply it. Um, I have to transpose, like I said, because it does columns. I want to multiply the rows. And then multiply it by this top edge kernel, which I've turned into a, by using this view thing, turn into a one by oh, six, no, one by nine uh, vector, right? Then I got to reshape it back into an image again. But then once I've done that, there it is. That's the result of the convolution that we've seen before, right? The edge detection convolution, horizontal edge. <clears throat> okay, so that's cool, but we don't actually need to worry about that because PyTorch also has a convolution 2D thing built in as well, which we can just apply directly. There's some, always with these things, there's some funny business with the dimensions. It needs, um, the image is fine. It needs to be a one by, uh, right? Oops, I didn't mean to do that. What? Where's M0? Oh. So this, the shape of this image is one, there's a one batch, there's a batch, um, Panel. panels, height. horizontal, vertical, or whichever one, right? But if, I forget which way it goes, but height and width or width and height. Yeah, because that tensor flows, like, it's channel at the end or something like that, right? Right, channel, this is channel first, even though it's not first, but it's channel first on yeah. the batch. Uh, okay. Tensor flow does the same thing, but it was channel last. So this is the shape of the images. Here they have one thing in the batch, only have one channel. And the um, the convolution expects the same kind of shape for the kernels, except now it's going to be input, the number of input channels or output channels, and then the width and height. So in this case, I only have one input channel, one output channel, so I just put none in there, which is the same thing as putting a single empty additional, as you remember, right? Just expands our, unsqueezes, I guess, right? uh, our kernel. Right, so that's great. But actually, we do have a bunch of, I have a thing already defined, edge kernels, which um, has the right shape. Well, actually, does it? Yeah, I guess we may have the right shape. So uh, four, I guess it's output channels, then input channels. I said it wrong. So it's output channels, four, input channels, and then the width and height of, this, the, width and height of the kernel is the shape it should have. So, in that, so I can apply this using F convolution 2D. And we can take a look at one of the uh, images. So now we've got a four channel image coming out. One of the channels is the horizontal, one's the vertical, one's the diagonal up for. Uh, right. Those are the, the four it, things that we fed in. Yeah, right? the four the, kernels I put in. Yeah. Uh, now keep in mind, we're putting these in in, a, in the actual uh, deep learning algorithm. We'll be putting in random things and letting yeah, it learn, learn these them. kernels. Right. So if these yeah. are interesting things for the purposes of whatever your, your loss function is, it may learn things like this, but it won't, you don't put these in, right? Okay, the next thing he talks about, how are we doing time? Oh, great. Uh, strides and padding. Again, this is something we talked about before, so I don't want to belabor the point, but just a reminder that padding is putting pick zeros, around, usually zeros, uh, padding around your image to make it have the size that you want it to have. Um, and 
if the kernel size is odd, if we add kernel size um, divided by two, now uh, without the remainder, I forget what that's called. But modulus. Well, the modulus would be the other integer one, division or something like that. Yeah, integer division that's a good name for it. So integer right. division okay. uh, here, so that it'll always produce an integer. Um, if it's KS is odd, this will keep the output size. If we destroy the one, we'll keep the output size the one. Output size the same as the input size. So that's commonly done that the kernel size is odd. He says it's actually very unusual to have kernel size that aren't odd, just because. Well, not only that, not only can you not easily do this padding, um, but also it's kind of weird that the center of the kernel is not centered on a pixel. <laughs> so not saying you can't, there's nothing in PyTorch that says you can't do it, but that's just unco uncommon. Uh, and then we were striding over by one pixel at a time, but you can stride over by multiple pixels. That means you move the kernel, not just one pixel, but like multiple pixels over. If you do that, you will reduce the size of the image. Uh, and in the particular case, like if you have the padding of KS uh, uh, divided by two, kernel, uh, kernel size over two, and a stride of two, you'll reduce the input in, in half exactly, which is what we want. Well, which we, we, will, we, will, we will see that we want a half. Uh, let's see. But the example we did so far just had a stride of one with no padding. So the image got smaller a little bit because we didn't have any padding, and we moved over one pixel at a time. And the stride works in both dimensions. It's also moving across one, then the next row going down, like reading a novel. All right, so now we're ready to create a convolutional uh, neural network. Here's our um, uh, our parameters. Now we're going to have 50 hidden layers. Uh, the categories are 10. So this is a funny way of writing 10, of course, but <laughs> that is, in case you're wondering. And the size of the uh, images are N and M, right? So we're, we're good on all that. So we build up a neural network. We're going to make a sequential layer. The first layer will be a convolution. We'll take one channel, go up to 30 channels. Kernel size of three, padding one, so it keeps the same size. Uh, do a, a rectified linear unit, and then we're going to move back down 10 channels, so you have 10 categories. This should work, right? Well, I mean, obviously it's not going to work because it's called broken, but <laughs> he wanted to point this out that, well, we're not doing the right thing yet. We did get down to 10 channels, but we really need 10 outputs, period, not 10 outputs for every single pixel. We want to decide what number this was. Remember, that's our own goal, at least this initial take. So we need to reduce the image size so the output channels you know, are here only 10 period, no, not per pixel. Or in other words, there's only one pixel with 10 uh, categories. So the way we do that is by using the stride things we mentioned before. So we're just gonna use stride two to keep reducing by half image until we get down to one pixel, right? That's the strategy uh, for this. Well, by the way, we're doing right now, I don't know if I said, but he said, we're doing a, a, a warm-up exercise to do a classification before we do the uh, uh, auto. Um, what does it go? <laughs> auto encoding. Right? Auto encoding. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly yeah. forgot what we we're doing today. <laughs> what was the name of this lesson? Because we haven't talked about it at all. Okay, so that's all this function does. He likes to define lots of things. So you define. I mean, it's good practice to avoid repeating yourself, right? So he defines this uh, function that takes in number of input channels, number of output channels kernels, uh, the size of the kernel, the stride you want to use, and whether or not you want to slap on an activation function, which defaults to true. And that's all, this all just wraps that up. It just calls in turn the torch uh, convolution 2D, but also could add on this uh, activation function optionally. So we'll define that. And then now we find a better version of this thing that will start as a 28 by 28, but then we'll, using the stride two, which is a default, we'll just keep cutting it down by size. That that's all seems pretty straightforward. Um, and the we'll one thing it. I, I um, couldn't remember as you yeah. we were walking through this, why it worked, but I thought that, yes, the, uh, you know, you're you're decreasing the size overall as you, uh, as you kind of walk through the different convolutions, but weren't we also adding uh, uh, channels as we, as we went along? There was yeah, some, some part. One, yeah, so that's what these numbers are. So this is yeah, uh, okay. The one input yeah, channel, those grow, or input the channel. Yeah, they keep shrink. growing. Then there's 16 output channels at this point, and then we lower back down 10 output channels at the last yeah. one when we get okay. the output. Yeah, you're right. This is the the function takes the input channels and then the output channels. I guess NF is output channels, but and final maybe. I don't know why you call it that, but. <laughs> okay okay yeah okay so yeah left to right in to out and then the final last step we just flatten it out because we don't have to we don't really actually need to be an extra dimension of the one by one we don't need that um 
Well, there's only one pixel. We don't actually need that extra dimension, so it's going to flatten it. And sure enough, when we try this out on our batch of 16 images, we get out a tensor that's 16 by 10, which is exactly what we want, right? 10 uh, probabilities, well, potentially probabilities for each um, image. You didn't put a sigmoid on this, so I'm not, they're not really probabilities yet, but there are maybe logits is better, right? 10 logits for each, uh, uh, you know. So let's see, what is this all about? I forgot now. I forgot what this was supposed to be for. Oh, right. So now we want to talk about training this thing. And so we have a little aside here about the uh, getting it on the GPU. Uh, so the first thing he does is take the uh, train uh, data set and restructure it so it has the right shape, right? Um, Mainly the channel is the problem. It, it, the fact that it had one channel means it didn't have a I didn't have a rank for that originally, um, like X, X train. All right, so it was only uh, fifty thousand images. And, oh, and I guess we need to reshape and reinitialize images too. So they're already flattened down to seventy four, twenty by twenty eight, and they're fifty thousand. So we need to reshape this thing so it's got uh, channel dimension, which it didn't have. And so that it has um, also the 28 by 28. We don't, the minus one just means keep that dimension of the number of uh, 50,000. 50, just, that means put a, leave whatever was there, there kind of things with that piece. Okay. And so we're going to create a data set using our data set function, which I've already forgotten precisely how it works, but that's okay. It works. It combines the images and their labels together, right? Into a dictionary, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that was last week, and I already forgot. It feels like it didn't do that much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he defines here, a dev now this is like some additional, uh, first thing is interesting, he defines this defined device thing, which is kind of cool, because they'll detect what you have available, and then just, uh, that'll be what defined device means. That'll be the device. I don't know why it just doesn't call it device, but whatever. Um, definitive device? I don't know. <laughs> defined device? Not sure what he meant there. But if you have a C, if you don't have a CUDA, or you don't have a Mac uh, with uh, metal, it'll just be CPU. And I do have CUDA on here, but I'm not using that, the right kernel for that. So mine will be CPU here, which is fine for this thing. One thing interesting, I actually kind of didn't know about Mac and the NPS thing is so well supported. I never actually tried that. Anyone else, anyone have a MacBook or a Mac? I have, I have an Mac, old, but... I have an old one I don't use anymore. Yeah. Should, I already... only use Macs, but I don't know about that. Have you tried this? MP, have you no. tried this? Yeah. So I'll metal performance shaders, yeah. So there's a I clicked there's a link to a YouTube video here. I could probably um... is it for the? Oh wait, never mind. I don't think it matters. Uh, Apple Silicon versus uh, Intel yeah. Silicon type thing. <laughs> That's what I was gonna ask. Which one do you have? I have one of each. I have a <laughs> of each. a few machines. <laughs> I have um a MacBook Pro that has Intel, and then I have a Mac desktop in my office that is Silicon. Well, I posted in chat this YouTube video, this guy, I think it's got okay. Apple Silicon. Um, it's supposed to work on both, but I only I have Apple Silicon. I haven't tried it yet. I do have a computer with that somewhere around here, but I use a travel one for work. But um, I posted a YouTube video. This guy does a pretty good job of just demonstrating how that works and the speed up he gets with it. So probably worth playing around cool. with. Yeah, I should. Actually, one of my students is using Jax. He, oh, it says Apple Silicon. Com, yeah, he's uh, using, I think it also okay. works on the uh, Intel. But I have a student know. using Jax, but I don't think he has a Mac but, or a Mac. Well, Jax also works with, uh, with CUDA as well. Mm -hmm. Pretty well, very well, actually. So, okay, so back to this thing we're going to the optimizer as always. We're going to use the SGD. There's other optimizers. I don't know if we're going to cover them at some point, but there's like Adam and other. SGD is kind of the one that we've implemented. So I guess that's all we're allowed to use <laughs> for right now. <laughs> Although I think already SGD does a little bit more than ours does. Like I think it does some momentum type things. I'm not sure. Mm. All right. So we'll get to our training set and they'll just quickly fit it. Hopefully it's not going to take forever. And then, oh yeah. So I don't know, whatever reason he does it. I'm not going to bother with that. So yes, we can train it. We don't need, he doesn't need to do anything else with it. It's fine. Okay, so we can train a convolutional neural network. It works. We're good. Okay, that was the point of that whole thing. 
Oh, this, I think we talked about all this already, but he I spent some time talking about the arithmetic of convolution. Um, for example, this idea is it's batch size, channels, width and height, turns out, right? He mentions TensorFlow, is channels last, it's uh, number of channels, height and width, and then channels at the end. You have to look at the help files, maybe you do these things, make sure you get it right. Uh, this is where he uses Excel to talk about the receptive field again. I'm not gonna revisit that because we did it in less than eight. I just want to point out to me some key takeaways were that um, there's a kernel of, uh, there's a different, so there's a different matrix is going to be learned for each input channel. This is not clear because we didn't really cover that in that level of detail. Because we, we're looking at a one uh, uh, channel input, right? But in the middle, we have four channels or eight channels. And we're, for each one of those channels, there's going to be a new kernel. And also uh, for each output channel, there's going to be a new kernel. So that's a lot of kernels that are learned. Uh, not as many kernels as it could be if it's completely, uh, you know, flat linear layer, but nevertheless, there's still a lot of numbers. And what happens is, so for instance, we have three input channels and 10 output channels. There's going to be 30 kernels that are learned. They're all going to be different. So for the, if it's an RVG image, for example, just for be concrete, it was the red channel, we learn different kernels than the green channel did, even though it's of the same image. Hopefully we'll learn the same things if that's what's important. But maybe it, maybe it turns out that red edges over here are more important than green edges over there. It should have the opportunity to learn that. Um, the output of the 30 kernels though is summed over the input channel. So you don't end up with 30 outputs, you end up with as we wanted, which is 10 outputs, because the it sums over the three input channels. The three kernels are mushed are added together, are the results of multiplying, the results of applying the kernels, the results of the convolutions are added together. So that's something he didn't really say, but in detail, but that's what yeah. happens, how things get back down to 10 output channels. Only reason I mentioned because it took me a minute to understand. That's <laughs> maybe it took you a minute. That's what's going on there. Uh for color images, as I just mentioned, it's just three input channels instead of one input channel, but everything's the same. We've, we already have multiple input channels further on in this, in these uh, convolutional, in, for, in deeper layers, right? Uh, he does mention this idea of the receptive field being the area of the input that affects the output pixel. And that's one of the reasons why we need deeper networks is to reach further and further out into the, uh, for the output to reach further and further out into the image. So it's not just looking at very, uh, you know, very small pigeon, uh, Pinhole, you know, part of the image. Just look at the whole image eventually. Does he mention? Sorry, I didn't watch this video, but did he mention? Is the receptive field just referencing one in, within one channel, or is it also like across channels? Well, he, I, he's talking, for example, that one particular output channel it wouldn't matter though, because all the output channels have the same receptive field. But one particular pixel, like what at this level, what how many pixels of the input are affecting this layer's? I get it, calling it pixels is kind of funny, but this layer's pixel, let's call it, right? This this particular channel on this particular pixel at this layer, how many of the inputs are getting fed into that? And as you can see, as you go deeper, it branches out further and further and further. And the same yeah, thing- I thought he, he had a pretty now. good demonstration of he that. Did. We, I did, I, I didn't- He did it in I, Excel. I thought, we, used the, I, I thought we did do it before, but maybe we didn't, so. I, I, I don't recall him using that term before. Oh, um, okay, maybe I should have tried to produce a, but I recommend looking at the video then for that part, if you don't, because he does do a nice little demonstration in Excel. With the trace precedence. So he's kind of showing like, I have this yeah. layer over here, trace it yeah. back to the, these cells over here. And then he traces it back to the original image. And you can see, you know, mm -hmm. uh, every cell in the original image that, or, which is a pixel, I guess, in this case, that was yeah. impacted. Like so I apologize. I, I thought for some reason we had covered it before, but probably we didn't. Um, no, it's okay. I was just... But just look oh, at the video for wonder. that part. It's like in it's spatial the, statistics, it's, it's, we would say like just hmm. a neighborhood, the neighborhood and not like a receptor. Well, it is, but it's like the neighborhood of the neighborhood of the neighborhood, right? As you go further back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know what that's all about. So, so now we're, by the way, if you want to look at somewhere before the 56 minute mark, <laughs> just before that, I guess where he does that. Because at the 56 minute mark, okay, we finally are going to get the autoencoders, which is the name of this thing. We're going to open up the autoencoders notebook. So again, because we're in a new notebook, we have to, re I'm not, but he is. We have to, and I made it so I could start here if I needed to. Um, but by the way, I structured my notes so that it's each lesson is a single notebook when I'm doing it, because it makes sense for, even when yeah, I'm not presenting, that's what I have. I have all these notebooks that I made. Uh, that's what those are for. Um, I wish kind of he had done things that way. Again, I've mentioned this before, but it's really hard to figure out like where stuff is. I guess you, you, the YouTube has that like thing on the bottom sometimes. It's helpful a lot. Yeah, of times the like forum, I think, is where you have to go 
Oh, okay. The form is good. That's good. That's a good tip. Yeah. Go to the form and, and use that to find that table of contents of this thing so, or the index yeah. or something. Because I feel like thing. even the course web page isn't even like up to date. No, and another irritation on the course web page is that you see how I put this course repo link up here. Oh, the reason yeah. why I do that because you have to. There's only this link only appears in the very first lesson. I don't know why every lesson should have this, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> I go back and copy later every time. Oh, now where was I? Yeah, I had trouble finding that too. I mean, I cloned it to my. Yeah, um, I did too, actually. Old drive, but it, I do have it. I do have it in here now, but just for my own. In case I'm on another computer, I know where to find it. Okay, so at the 56 mark, we open up the autoencoder notebook. Um, this is all the same stuff again, nothing new. Um, now we're going to use the fashion MNIST data. And if you haven't seen this before, did we talk about it before in this? can't remember now. I think we looked at it initially last week. You yeah. did. That's true. The data sets. The fashion, yeah. I think John talked about it one time. No, it was John, yeah. Um, so we're going to load that in. Um, this is just uh, tra this transforming thing. All that's doing is converting these things to tensors. So we'll do that. This, this is all stuff we learned about last time, right? That I've also probably forgotten, but it does something to make a, <laughs> the data set, makes a data set. I'm going to make them sure they're tensors, OK? Let's look at one. There's a sneaker. And you should make the images small like this. If you make them big, they just look like pixels. Unless <laughs> <laughs> so, you squint a lot. Uh, we're going to use this collate dick thing we did last time. That's all review. Uh, again, there's 10 labels, just like in the MNIST thing. So we want it to be the same way, but uh, the 10 labels are now different. They're these 10 labels, t-shirts, coat, whatever, bag. Now, this is an interesting thing he does here, which I just want to just pause for a second. Um, this item getter thing, to me, really seems like, I don't know. Um, oh, I, I guess I did write some things here. So at this point, this is kind of like... Um, one of these things where he gets a little bit uneven is like, this is, he said, okay, I need to, I want to define use item getter because this is my little toy that I have to uh, get the labels for these things. So what does that do? Well, that just, item getter is a, uh, creates a function for you, right? From the labels so that when you call it with an index, it'll find that, find that label for you, right? Did I say that right? Well, that sounds about right. Uh, it's, it's been a week. But if you're uh, like in R, you know that you don't need to do that because if you just passed in, right? Um, if I just passed in YB, uh, I need YB 16, yeah. I'm sorry, if I just passed in labels, wait, what's labels again, right? Labels, stop with your mistyping there. Anyway, label. Labels is this, okay, I remember now. Okay, in R, you can do something like this, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll just work. Yeah, I'll just like repeat. Yeah. <laughs> just put those in. It'll call. It'll find those right things in there for you, right? Mm -hmm. That's what this item. That's all this item getter is doing. And, and by the way, you can do the same thing in pandas and numpy. If we made this into a numpy array, it would work. Um, or we could do this. You know, use our friendly list comprehension. It would work as well. I like both of these better than this <laughs> <laughs> because this just seems a little obfuscated to me. I don't know. Maybe get used to item getter, but I. Honestly, I've been using Python since it was invented, and I never have ever used this function. I think getter maybe is missing out. <laughs> <laughs> that was my little rant on item getter. Okay. And it's not important. We don't use it anymore. So it's just like it's strange. <laughs> All right. So we're going to use our show images that we defined either last time or previously to take a look at some of these, right? So this show images thing nicely labels your images yeah. by what labels you in the training set. All right, so we'll warm up again, classify, we use the same, basically the same. Uh, now the batch size is different and um, the images are, are the same, the same shapes, everything should basically work the same. We use the same uh, model we used before, I think, right? Looks we'll like it. Train it. And it's not extremely slow, it's not extremely fast either. Mm -hmm. Jerry mentioned something about these not these being PIL images and having to be converted, but they're really not. I mean, they've already been, we're not using, he, he, uh, where did he, where did he put, I guess I deleted the thing. 
Oh, so DSD train zero is a PIL image. Oh, that's probably why it's so slow. That's what's going wrong here. Um, it's really not that slow, by the way. But, uh, but we're not using DSD. We're using DLS, and DLS already did the conversion. So I don't know what, what, what he's going on about there. That shouldn't be a factor. The DLSs are fine. They're tensors. So no, no problems with these. Sometimes yeah. when you're up there lecturing, you just kind of get <laughs> lost. Yeah. And then you're like, I just got to keep going. Hope no one calls me out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Did it do it? Did it do well? It's a uh, image. It's supposed to be label nine. Um, Cause it's, and let's see the label nine. Well, it looks like label nine got the biggest logic. So I guess it's not doing too badly. That's, that's as far as he, he goes with that, because now it's time to, uh, oh, so he mentioned there's some issues. It's time to go to the auto code. So we're not gonna spend too much time evaluating that uh, that classifier. Uh, there are some issues, he says, with multi-processing in the data loader, you can put number of workers equal to eight, um, but that you can't do that here. Right? This, this train can be sped up by just using more workers. Uh, right now it's only using one CPU core. So even though it's using CPU, it's actually only using one core. It's, it's slower than it needs to be. You can't just put no workers eight there because of the dictionary collator is somehow incompatible. We'd have to rewrite the whole thing. He says, we're not doing that. So forget that. Um, our accuracy of 83 compares it to the, apparently these leaderboards, which are kind of cool. Um, I, don't, I won't share the screen, but you can also share the link on the chat. Um, that's in the papers with code website where you can see like the best people have done on training classification on MNIST and, and various other things too. Uh, Kind of neat. So you can see how well you're, if you're trying to learn things, you can see how well your model does. So the best accuracy in there was 96%, or 83% is not that great. Of course, if you look at it, you'll see the 83, the 90, well, now it's actually 90, yeah, 96% ones doing fine tuning darts for image. I don't know what that is. So um, that's probably something we haven't learned anything about yet. So it's not just this model built your training better, it's this model, it's a better model too. Anyway, we're going to put all that aside and go on to the autoencoder. Um, this is just my, now we're at an hour and five minutes. It took a long time to do those last few minutes, apparently. So again, the idea is to compress the image into a smaller representation and then decompress it back up. Uh, so here the labels are the same as the input. That's the auto labels here being an actual image. Uh, so we're gonna do a mean squared loss of the input and output images. That's the auto part of the name, or auto, there's no labeling. Uh, the encoder part is the compression part. The decoder is to decompress. We've talked about this before, I believe. So we're gonna have to decompress. How are we gonna do that? Uh, we're going to deconvolve somehow back from the compressed image. One way to do that is, I guess um, these are out of order, is to do a transpose convolution. That's the thing that that um, PyTorch has. He said that's left for an exercise of the reader, this, or I guess watcher, but I didn't do that. Um, I can't remember if that's covered in the uh, text in the convolution chapter or not. But instead of doing that, do something a little simpler, and that is his nearest neighbor upsampling. So we're just going to take we're going to take a four by four image and make it eight by eight by just duplicating the nearby nearest neighbors, and then we'll follow that up by a stride one convolution. That's our upsampling method. So he, I'm not going to go through this in detail because I see we're getting close to the end here. Um, but uh, essentially, he just has to redefine. Um, well, first he defines a deconvolution error that does this upsampling near 2D, which is a, something built into PyTorch. Great. Uh, follow that by a, one, a stride one and convolution, just like we said. So it does just what we just said we're going to do. And it's kind of cool. It's so easy to just write that. One of the nice things about PyTorch or TensorFlow or any of these things, even Jax to a lesser extent perhaps, is that you can start to just like connect these things up, like Tinker Toy fashion and make models that do interesting, fun things. So. It's kind of cool you can do that. And if you look at uh, you know large language models uh, like GPT, but you look at GPT two or something, it's a simplified version of that. It's basically that, right? You can see, oh, you can see it's just using you just connecting these different things together. Some of the things are more complicated than that we haven't seen yet, but we will eventually see um, the transformer, for example. We'll see that. So we'll see that little tinker toy part eventually. It's probably what the hell is a tinker toy? But anyway. Still have those? I know what a tinker okay. toy is. <laughs> I, I don't know what it that's is. That's probably all <laughs> the toys. <laughs> it's just like fashion. All the toys like cycle back. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Um. Wait. I have a question. Yeah. What does a star mean in the star layers? In this return? is uh, an unpacking thing. So 
Um, if you oh, have, like the yeah, it just unpacks a okay. list so that we that okay. become the arguments. There's star star okay. and then there's star 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 unpacks a dictionary into things like um, you know I don't know color. If you had a dictionary, color yeah. red, right? Star star would unpack that to become a list like color equals red, right? Mm -hmm. With star it does just just for a list or any kind of iterable. Um, it'll unpack it. So they just, it'll just unpack them into arguments. Okay. So, and I think in Python works, parlance, isn't that called the splat operator? I, yeah, I don't know if this one's splat or they're both splat or is it star star splat? Are they both two different versions of splat? I, at least the, the single uh, asterisk. This thing one is splat? Is splat, I think so. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I've heard that term, but I always forget which one it applies to. Okay, I don't know why I did that. Okay. So yeah, splat operator, that's the, you can look it up that way. It works both ways. As you remember, we used it last week, I think, or two weeks before. Like if you have an argument like star args, right? It'll take all oh, the yeah. arguments and turn it into a list. So it goes the other way. The same symbol, but it goes the other way. It's used a lot in Python, so it's worth you know reading up on that or getting comfortable with it. Uh, let's see. So this is just some boilerplate to evaluate how well our our output's doing and to do the training. This is essentially the same training we did before, except the loss is different. And uh, one thing he mentions, I think here or later, is like, this is kind of a pain that we had to, this is all kind of very similar to what we already did, right? A lot of these pieces are the same, but we had, to, we had to change the loss function. We had to change the metric. That's inconvenient. But so just pointing that out. <laughs> um, but we're going to make baby's first autoencoder here, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we're just going to take our... Uh, one issue here is that he zero pads the thing first. There's a TensorFlow thing for that as well, a module for that called zero pad, just to, so that it starts out at 32 by 32, so you can divide by two and get 16 by 16, rather than start going to 14 by 14, just to make it a little nicer. Uh, I think that's so you can get down to four by four in the center, and then we explode it back up. And again, the last layer, we don't put an activation layer on, but we don't do the logistic function. So again, we're getting, um... oh no, we do, sorry. So now we don't do a sigmoid, so he turns them into probabilities at the end. Um, yeah. Well, except they're not probabilities anymore. Now they're image, uh, they're the, they're the image. So I guess a sigma is just to kind of normalize it a little bit. So it's not, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not doing probabilities anymore. So, okay. So let's see, let's try and see if it works. We'll try to evaluate our initial untrained model first. Um, it's called AE for autoencoder because letters are expensive and hard to type. And <laughs> I mean, as you mentioned that that last step, the sigmoid. I'm wondering if we even really needed to do that because you know he got really he didn't get good results, and I'm wondering if he just didn't do this that. A good point. Later. So it's something that's yet another thing you can try, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So so initially the loss is, and the loss doesn't really mean anything, but because we're not uh, it's the mean squared error, but we don't really know uh, we don't have a metric another metric we can use right now, right? There's no accuracy. What else can we do, right? I'm gonna take an eye, eyeball them, right? So we can try fitting this. I probably should make a mistake here. I'm not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. It does take some time. But here's what I get. I got this is what he gets to the first try through is like these are the these are the uh, output blobs that are supposed to match the input, the reconstructed images. Well, they don't look or maybe that's a shoe. Okay, fine, <laughs> but uh, what the heck this is? Handbag, <laughs> mushroom? I don't know what do these things are. Mushrooms. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but um Remember, they, oh, here, this is what they were. Yeah, I wonder if that is that's because graphs, of sigmoid. Yeah. No, you make a good, that's a, that, you make a good uh, question. I mean, you raise a good point. Um, that's not very good, but we can perhaps fiddle around with it a little bit better. So he does some things to fiddle around with it, takes out the middle couple layers. Uh, he changes it to an atom optimizer. I forget there's maybe something else he did here and runs it again. And it actually does a lot better. Oh, yes. Right? Maybe taking a sigmoid out is another thing. Maybe there's other things we can try. Uh, but this leads right into his next thing. It's like, well, this is, a, oh, by the way, just as an aside, this is kind of a pain, right? Iterating manual like this is too slow. Right? You have to keep going through, changing things by hand. Uh, maybe you have to change your learner a little bit. I mean, you're, that's how you're learning. You're getting ahead of myself. Change your training loop a little bit. To, oh, we did, right? We had to change an optimizer. Um, mm -hmm. All these things is, is kind of a pain. So we should automate this so we can experiment, just like you were saying. So... I did want to just take a look, by the way, on this slightly better version. What does the inner layer look like, the four by four layer? So I pulled that out. 
um, just to see. Well, I guess now it's eight by eight. We didn't go down to four by four. So you can see what, whatever encoding is using is still using a lot of the spatial information. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't really seem like I learned anything that interesting to me. But these are color, these are color just because they're uh, four channel images at this point. They're not meant to represent um, real color. But mm -hmm. I don't have to the fourth channel when I, when I show this image. <laughs> it just gets ignored. I just say, hey, let's see if this works. Yeah, look at that. Make something. So. Well, maybe it does the sign. Isn't there another like CYMK Alpha? or something? Cyan, yellow, magenta. Oh, that could be. Color okay. scheme. Is either that or puts it into alpha or something, which case it's like a transparency thing. So this is now we're getting into uh, this, as usual, at the end of this, now we're near the end. We're at hour and 15 mark of this hour and 37 long video. And he's going to just keep going. <laughs> he can't slow him down. We're going to do the learner now. But all he does at this point, I just uh, just says, uh, to tell you what I'm going to try to accomplish here, is he just introduces the concept of the learner and a couple, and one other thing about um, decorators, right, that he wants to talk about here. The rest of it, I think, is going to all be on next week's well, is it next week or two weeks? Is next week the um the break? Yeah, I'd say it's yeah. yeah. So we in got, two weeks. I, is that right? Because the 16th. I thought we still had one more before the break. Oh. Um Oops. wait. Oh no, you're right. There was one more. There is one more? Okay. I think. And staring. Yep, you're right. So John's gonna do the learner framework next week so we should probably cool. reach out to him though just to make sure yeah he'll be able to do it because he's he's been I kind of bogged down all right so this is a, yet another new notebook so we're going to do again calling in a bunch of stuff we already did um i put did i put i don't think i don't think i made another python file from the previous thing oh no i did so I took some of the functions from the up above and put them into this mini min I, I, I convolution thing. But all it is is this convolution. Uh, I guess I forgot to put the deconvolution thing. I might need that too. And the two device and define device and the collate over device functions are in there now. They're already defined in this notebook, but if I want to start here, I, they, this should all work. I never tested that. But hopefully it works. And what's going to happen is we're going to use a class now to capture and encapsulate all these different uh, pieces from our fit function. Um, so and so we're going to create a learner. It's uh, kind of be created from, you have to give it the model that you want to use. You're going to have to give it your data loaders, a loss function, learning rate, uh, whatever optimizer you want to use, it's going to default to uh, this. Oh, this is a reminder. This is something he invented in fast core that automatically for the trivial case, where you're just going to save these as local or as instance variables. It just does that for you. Right, uh, magically. And then it's got a fit function where now he's refactored things so that, um, for example, instead of everything being squeezed in here, uh, it's for each epoch, it's going to call this one epoch function. With true here is, I think, whether or not it's um, training or not, right? Training or so you do something different when you're in training versus, uh, we will see later that training mode versus. Uh, inference mode or they call it in in uh, PyTorch is different for some things like for dropout layers and uh, batch normalizing, I think these kind of things mm -hmm. are different. So a uh, one epoch in turn calls uh, I guess where does it call it? One batch somewhere. There it is, one batch. <laughs> it calls one batch. Uh, and then one batch does the actual work here. I won't go into detail because all the came same kind of things we had before. Uh, nothing really different yet. Okay. This just takes everything we already did. It's still not any more flexible. If anything, maybe it's more inflexible because we've kind of shoved everything on big giant one little clap, but it still works. I'm not going to run it. Um, but, but, but let's see. One of the things we're going to want to do is use different metrics. We don't want to always use the same. He has this calculate stats function here that calculates the metrics. This is calculating an accuracy metric. Uh, we don't always necessarily want that. We want something that's only appropriate for certain problems. We want this learner to be completely general. So we're going to factor that out. So we'll put that in another class. We'll call it metrics. And so this is the vector class he defines. I don't know how much detail I need to go into this, but uh, 
it doesn't do much really, except capture the idea of being a metric. So you could pass it as something else. It could have been a function, but this is Python. So Python way to do things is to define functions. Um, so it has this add method that you add in uh, your batch, and then it will calculate the. It'll do a self dot calc, which will, in this case will just return whatever inputs it had, and it will save them, right? And then you can get this property to get back the uh, the values, and then and actually at that point it actually calculates the the accuracy. Uh, or the metric in that case again this this the metric is meant to be a super class you so it's a subclass so for to actually do the accuracy thing you have to override the calc method and then actually calculate the accuracy here i hope i'm not doing that too i kind of that was kind of sloppily said but i hope that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah right so we like are be... slowly building the uh, fast ai yeah. library here yeah. right yeah <laughs> i'm just i'm just you, kind of hard right yeah I'm just conscious of the time, so I'm trying to not kill ourselves here. I don't want to leave too much for. I don't want. I don't know in the next video how much this he goes over again when John takes over. So, so that's it. Turns out that uh, we're not going to use this metric class. <laughs> we're going to use Python's PyTorch's version of it anyway, and it's slightly different uh, API. It turns out, so we can just skim past that. I think. So the next thing he's going to do is to find the learner so that in addition to the, well, to do the metrics, we're not gonna just say, hey, learner, here's the metric. Instead, we're gonna add these this idea of callbacks to the uh, learner. So you're gonna be able, you're gonna tell the learner, hey, when you're learning, at, before, before you do a fit or after you do a fit, both or either one, call this function I'm gonna give you. That function will do the metrics and print out the results as a callback. So remember we talked about callbacks last week, right? Did we? We did, yeah. Okay, so this, this is why, this is where this comes in. <laughs> This is where this comes in. Um, these are just some exceptions that are needed to uh, handle errors during the callbacks. This order thing is needed to, uh, I don't think he talks about it at all. He just defines it here. So he's kind of going over this pretty quickly. I think he goes back. The way he goes through this notebook, he kind of jumps. And then I looked at the beginning of the next video, he jumps back. So it's kind of confusing um, that way, I think. So this order thing, I don't think he talks about, but what it does, it allows, it's an optional thing you can give to your callback class so that the, it'll know which order to call them in. So if this thing should always be called after this other callback, it'll make sure that that happens that way. So this is, um, this, this, this callbacks is gonna be a decorator. I don't know if you can use this thing. And uh, what it will do, so this is a decorator as a call. So this is another Python thing, right? Remember decorators are functions that are called uh, when you define a new function, you pass, it takes your function like as a higher order function as a variable, it does some things to it and then returns a function. So instead of defining it as a function here, he defines it as a class, a callable class. But it still works just fine. You can use callable classes as uh, decorators as well. Yeah. And so that's what this decorator does. And I really think we're getting, I really want to be conscious of the time. I think we're running out of time. So is there anything I can sum this up quickly? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Not really. i tell you what I'm going to do. So hopefully that he comes back. I think he does come back to this callbacks thing. I know he does. He Because there's a part of the notebook that I don't reproduce here where it goes through and does just the callbacks part only. But in the video at this point, he kind of goes, well, this is to show you what the full thing is going to look like. So there's this big... Um, there's all these callbacks he should do, that's defined. He doesn't tell you how they're defined. They're just more callbacks. This is kind of like, how, how are these used, right? That's the most important thing. So there's a uh, learner with, there's a big learner. Where is it? Where is it? I just want to just put it on the screen for a second. Is this it? Yeah. So this is the new learner class. They use a lot of things we haven't talked about yet. It has a lot of callbacks. It does callbacks. Like before it does a fit, it's going to, that's what this callback decorator is going to make it so it'll automatically call whatever callbacks you define when you define the fat class, when you find the object, okay? So let's just do it, it's easier to see. Uh, skip all this, skip all this, skip all this, boom. Okay, so here's my model. I, I can't evaluate this because I didn't find everything, but I already did before. Here's my model. Uh, it's the same model we've been using. It's actually not the same model, it's even a simpler model, it's just a linear model. Okay, just to, for, just to show an example. NLP, um, great. Here's the callbacks I want. I want a device callback. That makes sure I'm on the right device. I got a train callback. That'll do something with the training. I don't know what it is. Does metrics callback? <laughs> that one will no. I mean, this is using the PyTorch metrics callback and using this thing called multi-class accuracy, not the accuracy we defined before. But that's what he did. Uh, this callback will give us our accuracy on every every training loop. 
progress callback will give us this cute little callback thing. Oh, I think the train callback does this nice little plot, right? So with all those callbacks, I then make a learner with the model, the data set, the loss, the learning rate, and the callbacks list. It's very modular this way, right? And I just call learner fit, and it just mm -hmm. it does all the things, right? It's completely configurable this mm -hmm. way with these callbacks. That's the main takeaway from this section so far, I believe. Yeah. And then next week he's going to take a step back and say, "Okay, what? <laughs> How's this all work? What are these callbacks <laughs> doing?" And so he's going to make a simple learner that just does callbacks, um, a learner with callbacks only, just and structure it a different way, just to kind of see how it works. Just, oh, so it's I, like a. Yeah, like you said, a modular way to ask for more things. Yes, and I, I'll just point out that this methodology of using callbacks is is uh, how fast AI does things, but it's also how uh, Lightning does things. It's how uh, Keras does things as well. Keras now works with PyTorch. Um, it's how many deep learning and other uh, learning things allow you to have hooks into this into the process because there's a big long process happening and you're like wow i wish at this point i could put a line in here well you can't because it's not your code anymore so it gives you this opportunity with these callback hooks hope that makes sense i don't know oh yeah that makes sense so you but, could put your own callbacks as well yeah you can exactly you just have to follow the callback protocol you have to find the before after mm -hmm. whatever methods you have to define uh, to do that you can make your own callbacks and say, hey, I'm at this point in the print for debugging. It could be very useful, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. That's cool. All right. So well, I think that's it. And we're all set yeah. for next week, I believe. I Sorry, I went a little almost, well, well, 401. I'm not doing too bad. No, I've got to speed up at the end. Stuff. You get, yeah. You got to do what you got to do to get through it. But that yeah, concludes good this job. One. I'll just put